to everybody and welcome to our last webinar of the year. Woohoo! If I'd have known that, I'd have put some confetti emojis on or icons on some of the screens. Uh, just as a reminder, the information is uh, current as it is today, but we do have some things that change quite often. Um, and we'll do a summary of the CPT changes. Um, then break into a sectional review of the changes. What I've done is I've included the category three codes in with that anatomical section where they belong. And what I do want to point out is CPT code 0499T was originally published by the AMA as to be deactivated, but that change was rescinded in the CPT um, errata and technical corrections document on November 1st. So your book is going to show that that code was deleted, but you'll want to go ahead and print off the CPT errata pages and keep those with your book because that change has been rescinded. And I, I do have a, a link to that uh, document in my references. So let's go ahead and get into a summary of the changes. So our one of the questions that we get quite often is, why don't your totals for the changes equal what is published by the AMA for their changes. And what we do is we are looking only at those changes that are new for 2023. When the CPT publishes their changes, they are counting anything that was not in the 2022 book that is now published in the 2023 book. And so their, um, their counts are inflated over what we have. And so uh, that's going to include like your mid, you know, the mid-year release of your, uh, the PLA codes, the MAAA, your, and then all of the COVID-19 vaccine and administration codes. So that information, we're not counting as being brand new for 2023. And then if we have any um, revisions to a short or medium description only, we're not counting that as a change. So this is kind of more of a, okay, this is what's going to be new for 2023. All right, so let's get into a sectional review of our changes and we're going to start with the surgery section. And that's your 1000 through the 69999. So in the integumentary system, we do have some changes. And most of these are going to be somewhat related to some changes that are we'll discuss later regarding the hernia codes. Uh, and so um, the interesting thing about the new hernia codes that have been published is there are no global days associated with it. And so um, when they've done the revisions to the suture removals, this is kind of to help um, code for those, the suture removal for the hernia repairs where the patient's coming in and to help get reimbursement for those suture removal kits. And so um, in here, they've deleted the 15850 and they have revised the 15851. So uh, what the, so I've provided the example of the difference between the 2022 and the 2023 version. So um, what they've done is they've added the removal of sutures or staples requiring anesthesia. And IE means, um, it's Latin for id est, meaning it is or that is. And then the information in the parenthetical notes is the list of what is um, that example. So, um, so that requiring anesthesia means it has to be general anesthesia or moderate sedation. It does not mean local. And then moving on, um, I'll start with the codes, the 15853 and the 15854, so the bottom two codes. So the new codes are for the removal of sutures or staples or the removal of sutures and staples. And these are not requiring anesthesia. And these you can list in addition to your E&M code. And so 
Um, in the physician fee schedule, um, code 15853 has a reimbursement just under $15, and the 15854 is just under $20. And of course, it's going to um, change dependent on your location and whether you're, you know, rural, suburban, that kind of thing. All right, now the top code, 15778. Uh, this is kind of for a specific use because it's your implantation of absorbable mesh or other procedure or prosthesis for a delayed closure of a defect due to a soft tissue infection or trauma. So um, in the guidance that's provided for this codes, you would not use this for the insertion of a pelvic floor mesh because it has its own code in the female genitalia section. Um, it's not used for the insertion of a synthetic implant, for the reinforcement of an abdominal wall because there's a separate category three code for that. Um, and it's not used for the repair of the anal rectal fistula plug because there's a separate code for that. Um, and so if you're going to use this, be sure to check the guidelines because there is a lot of guidance within the notes. So it is specific for um, a delayed closure due to soft tissue infection or trauma. All right, and with that, we'll kind of move to the musculoskeletal system. Now, there are some quite a few updates to the musculoskeletal procedure guidelines. And um, in the HIM-focused webinar that Jennifer did just the other day, she covered some of the changes in the guidelines. Uh, but I have so many slides in this deck that um, it was just kind of impossible to capture all of it. So um, if you work with musculoskeletal, well, any of the procedures, be sure to be checking your guidelines because there are quite a changes. So some other significant updates were made to the guidelines for like an incomplete amputation and replantation codes. Um, and they have the AMA has removed specific guidance regarding modifier 52, um, it's been removed. And so it gives you additional guidance as to what you should be reporting separately. But within this area, um, for the revised codes, we've got your arthrodesis code. So your um, posterior inner, inner body technique, the, um, both of them had a semicolon at the end and that's being removed. So there are kind of some changes within this. Um, because it's going to affect how some of the codes are used. But we have your 22857. Again, this one is now adding the semicolon and adding that uh, single interspace for lumbar. And this is the 22857 is becoming a parent code. And we'll, when we get to the new code, you'll see what, um, what the baby code is. Um, but for the 27280 is really just kind of a cosmetic change. Uh, CM CPT is trying to kind of um, get all of their terminology in a, in a row. And so they just kind of rearranged uh, where open was and, cha and changed the word including to includes. But the new code, the 22860 is your is total disc arthroplasty for an artificial disc. And um, this is a now the baby code to the 22857. And this is replacing a new technology, the category three code 0163T. And there are some specific um, coding instructions within the within the CPT book. So the 22860, it's intended to be reported for the second interspace in conjunction with the 22857. Now, if you treat more than two interspaces, then you use the 22899, the unlisted code, for the entire procedure. So if you do you know, three or four, you're not going to report the 22857, the 22860 plus um, you know, any multiple units, you are just going to report the unlisted code for the entire procedure. All right, and this is where we have a category three code. And um, the 
It has to do with the sacroiliac joint or your SI joint. Um, and so there is 0775T, which is an arthrodesis of the sacroiliac joint. And this is percutaneous. And for the intraarticular implants, it is um, something more along the lines of a sling. And so it stabilizes the SI joint um, between the two bony surfaces, between the iliac and sacral bones. And then it, the, the sling is kind of pulled tight um, to create tension to accomplish the stabilization. Now it differs um, because code 27279 is kind of a, for a percutaneous minimally invasive arthrodesis and it places a fixation, an internal fixation de device. And so it's a little bit different. It has different work, different device, different approach. Um, and the, the um, kind of the sling that's used for the 0775T does not transfix the SI joint like is the work accomplished in the 27279. All right. so. Another category three code is a, a computer-based musculoskeletal ass assessment, also known as a surface mechanomyography. And so what this does is there are sensors that are placed on the body and then the, um, the motion is, is then measured. And for the example here, I have it on an upper extremity, but it can also be done on a lower extremity. And of course, you know, you almost have a book here for the description, um, you know, for multi-joint range of motion, posture, gait, muscle function. Um, and so it, it's a measurement and a recording of dynamic joint motion and muscle, muscle function. Um, and then also it incorporates multiple uh, non-movement measurements just to um, along at the same time. So, um, and it also, the sensors also evaluate the velocity of the body movement. And so it does um, collect a lot of information for them. And it's important to note that in the instructions, it is not a remote service. So this is not something that's part of the remote therapeutic monitoring or the, you know, the remote, um, the, the remote monitoring services. This has to be done in the office or um, outpatient department. All right, so in the respiratory system, we have a couple of changes here. Here we've got a new code, 30469, and you'll notice on the little, um, the little uh, picture I've got here on the right-hand side, that outer nostril kind of falls in a little bit. And that is kind of your outer, your nasal valve collapse. And so the 30469 is to help repair that nasal valve collapse using the low energy temperature controlled, meaning radio frequency. So it's kind of a radio frequency probe that is stuck into the nose and the wand is pressed against the nasal mucosa to create a lesion. And then that lesion kind of helps the nostril to pop out and not be prolapsed. So um, this is also commonly performed with other ablative procedures like your inferior turbinate ablation. And the code is considered inherently bilateral. So if it's only done on one side, you can use the modifier 52. And this was previously reported with the unlisted code. So if you're not using radio frequency, then you would still use the unlisted code. And um, I also wanted to mention that the um, inherently bilateral indicator is usually in the Medicare physician fee schedule. And um, there have been several incorrect, well, I, I guess, when I was working with the, um, the RVU file, there were several codes that were not listed uh, with their payment amounts in the, in the RVU file. So I'm expecting it to be republished. Uh, and so it shouldn't change the 
inherently bilateral procedure indicator on this procedure, but I did want to make you aware that um, there are some errors in the physician fee schedule review file and to expect a republication. There's also legislation out that is to um, try to stop the, um, the fee schedule cut, but I have not seen anything come through that is going to finalize that. Sometimes it does come out like, um, like the, you know, a couple of days before the new year or even after the new year. So they do go retroactive on that sometimes. So it's always a fun time at the end of the year trying to keep up with all of the changes. All right, within the cardiovascular system, there are some changes. So we've got a revised code, the 35883. And this is just kind of a small change where they're changing the word background to polyester so that it's not specific to a, a specific brand name. It can be used for other things. So um, some other, some new codes that we have, these are, are pretty cool. So I'm sorry for the wall of text, but the AMA um, is kind of putting everything that is incorporated within this procedure into the description. So this is for a percutaneous AV fistula creation in the upper extremity. And um, it is going to have a single access of both the peripheral, peripheral artery and peripheral vein, the fistula maturation process when performed all includes all your vascular access, your imaging guidance, and your supervision and interpretation. Um, and then your 36837 is for um, the, the dual access. So um, just for um, the 36836 uh, was something that would use the ellipsis system. So these are codes that used to have C codes for the hospital reporting, now coming over and having the kind of the real codes for physician reporting. And then the 36837 for your two separate access sites was when the um, the device would be the wavelength system. But um, those two systems are both for um, upper extremity use and they have not yet been approved for lower extremity use. But um, if you are doing percutaneous access sites into a lower extremity, then you would use the unlisted code. All right, and then there are some new codes for um, pulmonary artery revascularization by stent placement. And this is to help um, separate out between the arteries and the veins um, and then with the concept that they introduced last year of normal connections and abnormal connections is in place. So the 33900 is for a, the normal native connections, unilateral. Um, 33901 is for the normal native connections, bilateral. And then the 33902 is for the initial placement for the abnormal connections, unilateral. Um, bilateral, and then 33904 is the add-on for each additional vessel or separate lesion. So um, this is not kind of the, a new concept, but, you know, just as a reminder, the in the normal native connection, the flood, blood flows through the expected pathway through the heart chambers and great vessels. Now the patient could still have an atrial or ventricle ventricular septal defect or something like that, but the blood still flows and follows that normal, the normal pathways through the, you know, through the body. In the, in a normal native connection, that's where the body has created alternative connections for the pathways and um, like, it, you know, having a transposition of the great arteries or uh, like the tetralogy of fellow, those are kind of the, your abnormal connections. And so for um, CPT had a nice little table in the book, so I kind of used it here. So for a normal and abnormal, showing the unilateral, bilateral, and additional stent. So, um, you know, that's for either 
an additional pulmonary artery or a separate lesion in the same pulmonary artery. So just um, be aware it can do that. Now within the guidelines, there are a ton of guidelines. Um, I did not bring all of them over because then we would be here until tomorrow trying to go through all of this. Um, so if you do the balloon angio angioplasty without a stent, that's still reported in your with your 929 guidelines, but um, you know, make sure that it's not within the same target lesion that you're doing the 33901 through 04. Um, so um, the new codes do include all of your vascular access, all of that fun stuff um, that you're used to. But if you want, if you do code in cardiology, you will want to review the guideline changes because the AMA is providing clarity around what is considered part of the procedure and what can be reported separately. Um, and there are um, updates to the guidelines um, for like the transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation that I haven't cover covered. And the AMA has also added guidance regarding the right heart and left heart catheterization when it can be done and when it should not be done. Um, and they have added that guideline in several different sections. So they're really wanting to be um, provide clarity on what should be reported and what should not be. So you may want to review those just to make sure that you're capturing all of that that needs to be done. All right, and then in cardiology, they do have some new technology codes. And one of those is the absolute quantification myocardial blood flow or the AQBMF. Um, and so that is kind of done with the, um, as a spec study. Um, and it is with exercise or stress and it can be um, and at rest when it's performed. So you would report this in addition with to your other codes for your um, primary procedure. And this detects a re reduced coronary flow reserve and it can help um, identify patients with a high risk coronary artery disease. And this is an emergency um, emerging technology that uses different processes and software and imaging cameras and, and workflows. So um, it's a little bit different from some of the other studies that are already available. Now, another one is the insertion of a bioprosthetic valve. And this is done as through an open approach. Um, it does use duplex ultrasound imaging guidance, which is a little different from some of the other codes um, and so it also can include your patch graft when that's done. So um, this does, it is for um, conditions such as a chronic deep vein insufficiency, or if there's a reflux in the deep venous system or even leg ulcers. So there's a device that can be put in to help with that. All right, and then some other new codes that we have are some cardiac focal ablation procedures. And um, this is a new non-invasive treatment and that uses the functional radioablation in combination with mapping and targeting of, your, of any um, abnormal myocardium. And this is used to treat arrhythmias such as your ventricular tachycardia. And so you've got a code for, um, for the treatment, treatment plan and localization mapping. So um, you've got some different phases of of what's done. Now, usually the new technology codes are all put to status code C, which means they're priced and paid by the carrier. So a lot of, so if you can provide uh, information to the payer about, okay, this is very similar to what we do for this procedure. This is how much gets reimbursed for this, but it's different because of whatever reasons, and we feel it should have, you know, an additional, um, whatever justification you can provide, um, and, you know, any invoices for any different devices or uh, anything that needs to go in that to help the payer come up with a, a payment for that. So, all right. And if that's not enough to cause cardiac issues, maybe it'll cause digestive issues. 
And we have a couple of changes in gastroenterology. There are two new codes, and these are for the um, placement and removal of the intragastric bariatric balloon. So this has been performed for a while and has been done with unlisted codes. Now there are some new codes to report it. Um, and usually the balloon is left in place for about six months. And so when they are, um, when you're going to take it out, then it, the balloon is filled with water. So they pop the balloon, it drains into the stomach to be eliminated. And then, um, then they pull the, um, the balloon out. And if the, there is going to be uh, the removal of the balloon and then the placement of a new one, there's not a code that is for the remove and replace. You would go ahead and re report the two codes together to show that you're replacing, you know, you're removing one balloon and, and adding another one. And be sure to check the, um, the parenthetical notes because there are notes about, you know, don't report this with certain other EGD procedures. Um, some of them are like the transnasal. So um, in the description for this here, it says that it's transoral. So they just want to be clear that you're not, you know, trying to pull the balloon out of the nose, which then kind of gives you the, the picture of how they would mummify somebody and they pull somebody's brains out their nose, which is kind of where my brain goes for fun stuff. All right, and then some category three codes for uh, gastroenterology. They have 0780, which is your um, installation of a fecal, fecal microbiota via a rectal enema. And there is a live biotherapeutic agent that you get. There are current codes available for the installation of that, um, of that agent. Um, but there, it's through different means. And I guess the um, current way that it's normally provided is via enema. And this is for um, treatment of patients with C. diff. And then there are two bronchoscopy codes. And this is for um, treatment for um, patients with COPD, possibly uh, maybe some asthmatics. Uh, there are current codes for um, like the 31660 and the 31661, which is treatment of the bronchial tissue. But these two procedures are for the destruction of the pulmonary nerves. Um, and it's what's kind of odd is they've got the 78, the 0781 is the bilateral, and then the 0782 is unilateral. So it's a little flipped from what is normal. But um, what this does is it um, allows the, the radio frequency destruction of the pulmonary nerves. And then this should allow um, for better breathing because the pulmonary nerves get overactive and cause issues. And so you can go in and zap them. Um, and then you have one, you report the codes once per treatment session, not how many times you zap the different nerves. All right, and then there's another one for a 0779T, the gastrointestinal myoelectric activity study. And this is for the stomach through the colon. And it's a non-invasive procedure to assess the motility of the GI tract. Um, and so it's like an EKG, but instead of checking the heart, it's checking your GI tract um, and can be for, um, patients with a, maybe a prolonged ileus or having GI pain or other motility problems. There are other codes that assess motility, but they don't go all the way through from the stomach to the colon. So this is kind of a single code for, the, for doing those. So um, that is for those. All right. Now, um, the hernia repair, I wanted to give you a heads up that there are no global days. So um, there are a ton of changes. So it is going to be interesting. There are 15 um, new, new codes and there are 18 deleted codes. 
um, 16 new codes if you include the 15778, which was in the integumentary system, if you have that delayed um, mesh implant for the infection or trauma. Um, and so I just did kind of a, a did show the suggested replacement here. And just kind of as an overview, uh, codes the 49591 through 96 are for the, um, the repair of a reducible or an incarcerated slash strangulated anterior abdominal hernia. So um, all of these changes, well, these specific changes are for um, the anterior abdominal repair. Um, and there are some new codes for a peristomal repair that we'll get into. Um, and so it is um, going by, uh, you have codes for if it's reducible, a separate code for if it's incarcerated or strangulated. Um, one if it's, you know, also um, broken out if it's initial or if it's recurrent, and then it goes by size. And then there is um, the 49621 through the 49622 is for the peristomal hernia. And for that one, uh, they don't care if it's initial or recurrent. Um, it would be the, the codes. It's just whether it's reducible or the incarcerated is strangulated. And then a new code, the 49623, is the removal of total or near total non-infected mesh or other prosthesis during the repair. So um, the size is going to be important, um, as well as the clinical presentation, but it not, is not going to matter if it is open, laparoscopic, or robotic. So here is a table that the, uh, is in the CPT book to kind of help. So you have your initial by the size, whether it's reducible, and then the incarcerated or strangulated, and it shows the different codes that might be used. And then after that, I've got the list of the codes here. So here you can see it's like the 49591. All of these are going to start repair of anterior abdominal hernias, and that is going to be your epigastric, incisional, ventral, umbilical, stegalian, any approach, initial, um, and so the 49591 um, is initial and it is less than three centimeters reducible. If we go down to 49592, um, this is also initial, less than three incarcerated or strangulated. And then, um, so here we've got the 49593, which is your initial three, to si three centimeters to si 10 centimeters reducible. Um, and so it's kind of basically the same thing. I'm not going to bore you by reading through all of these. Now they did not um, change any of like the inguinal hernia codes. So those are still the same. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the 49621 and 22. So this is your, your peristomal hernia, um, just so that you could see they have, it's, it, whether it's initial or recurrent, it does include the implantation of mesh, all of them do, or other similar item. Um, and so the difference for the peristomal hernia is basically whether it's reducible or the incarcerated strangulated. Um, and then the 49623 is an add-on code. So you can um, report that in addition. All right. so. For these, you report the code only once, and it's going to be based on the total defect size. Um, the guidelines state you should measure prior to opening the defect because what will happen is the fascia um, usually retracts and will make your size smaller. And so what you do is you're going to measure the distance between them. Um, and you're going to measure the top to bottom or the side to side, which is your maximal craniocaudal or transverse distance between the, the mad margin of the defects. So um, Swiss cheese defects, where you have several that are kind of right in a row, those are measured from the, the top to the bottom, just to make sure you're getting all of those. Um, and so when you have both a reducible and 
an incarcerated or strangulated hernia, um, those are then, they're all coded as incarcerated or strangulated. And the example for measurements that is provided in the CPT book is that you have one uh, two centimeter reducible initial incisional hernia and one four centimeter reducible, or this one is incarcerated. So that is taking our total up to six. And then it is separated by two centimeters. So that is eight. Um, and so that gives us our eight centimeters. So we would report it with the 49594, which is the incarcerated codes. So the instructions also can state that you can report um, your inguinal, femoral, lumbar, umphacil, or the peristomal hernia separately. Um, and, but the mesh is also is always included. And just to reiterate, there were no changes to the inguinal, femoral, lumbar, umphacil codes. So those would still remain how they, how they currently are. So just make sure to read through the guidelines to read, you know, learn the do's and don'ts. Um, and so um, you can also report the repair of any strangulated organs or structures like your, the testes, ovaries, or intestine. All right, another category three code is uh, the 0748T, which is an injection of a stem cell product into a um, perifistular, perianal perifistular tissue. Um, this procedure is still in clinical trial, so it won't be reported a lot. Um, you can also report the stem cell product separately, and I would encourage you to do so because a lot of those stem cell products are very, very extensive. Um, and this is used to treat Crohn's disease. So as we finish with the, um, with those, it is time to go to the urinary system. And there aren't a ton of changes here. It's just, um, there are some uh, important changes to the codes um, 50080 and 50081. So here's the new description for the 50080. Um, so notice that they have said that this is now just for a um, nephrolithotomy and a, or a pyolithotomy. The nephrostolithotomy and the pyolostoleth, <laughs> I can't even pronounce those, I'm sorry. Um, though, that terminology is really no longer used. Um, and so it is through the anti-grade approach um, with a stent placement or an end tube placement when performed. Um, it does include your imaging guidance. What's important to note here is though, is that they have changed and called this a simple um, extraction. And kind of the examples for that is that the kidney stones or the um, any of the stones are up to two centimeters in size in a single location of the kidney or the pelvis, and it has non-branching stones. So what I want to do is kind of compare that to the 50081, which has kind of the same main um, changes, but this one is now called for complex. And what they kind of give as their examples for complex is the stones, you know, are are larger than two centimeters, might have branching stones, stones in different locations, um, or complicated anatomy. And this is kind of just an example. So there are other reasons that, um, that could make something complicated, and that's going to be up to the clinical decision-making of, um, of the physician providing the procedure. Um, and so it's kind of going into that, um, you know, that's what the doctor went to school for to learn. So they have the best judgment of knowing whether it's complex or simple. So it is a little tough on coders because it can be a little subjective. Um, so just work with your providers to make sure that you understand you know, their difference between the complex and simple. All right, and then on to the male genital system. There is a new code for a laparoscopy of a um, surgical prostatotomy, and this is kind of what they're calling a simple. 
procedure, and this is performed for benign indications, and this is going to differ from your radical prostate, prostatic, prostatectomy um, because it's not including the removal of the total gland or, or the tissue around the gland, um, but it is going to include the control of any post-op bleeding, um, a vasectomy, miototomy, um, and some of those other items. And if it does include robotic assistance, that's also included. Um, and then for some new category three codes for the prostate tissue, they have a couple of them. They have the ablation of uh, malignant prostate tissue. Now, um, this is for malignant tissue where our, the previous code was for benign. And um, so what this, um, the 0738T is for the treatment planning. And then the 0739T is for the procedure itself. And what that does is um, magnetic fluid is injected into the prostate. And then the patient returns usually on a weekly basis for some thermal treatment that lasts about 60 minutes. And, um, and it's very non-invasive, um, but the thermal um, treatment ablates the tissue. So it really limits the damage to the surrounding areas. Um, and is a lot less um, intensive than the radical or um, more intense ablation. All right, are, are you ready for the nervous system? Uh, now, I did not include all of the codes because um, as we've seen over the years, the AMA is taking a lot of the codes that are commonly performed together and creating a new code that reads like, <laughs> almost like a novel that tells you everything that's in there. So for codes 64415 through 64417, and for the 64445 through 64448, they are including that it's the imaging guidance when performed. And so I just gave an example of the 64415, that it's the injection of the anesthetic agent and or steroid in the brachial, brachial plexus, comma, and then including image guidance when performed. So that same phrase is being added to all of those codes. Um, and so I didn't, um, I didn't list all of those out, but also be careful because there are other codes in that same range that can report guidance separately, um, just not these specific codes coming up next year. Now on the next slide, we're going to cover facet joint injections. And, um, and so, the little, the little green spot there is where they're entering in the steroid medication in this specific example. And um, so what I've done is I've included some of the guidelines just right out of the book. So um, the image guidance is going to be required to report the 64490 codes, at, you know, the, the range of codes. Um, and so if no imaging guidance is used, then you would use the 20552 through 20553, which is your trigger point injections. And if ultrasound guidance is used, then the 02134567T codes should be used. Um, and then another important clarification is that the number counted is the number of the joints injection injected and not the number of nerves. So even if with in a single level, two nerves are injected within that joint, only one unit of service is counted. Um, the AMA also provided some guidance on modifier 50. They do have a, a, a table in the book. So if you wanted to go look at that, you can. Um, I didn't include it here because a lot of times the AMA and CMS fight over the reporting of modifier 50. Um, and so I didn't want to confuse you with all of that. Um, and so what I did not include in the slide is that if you do a, um, a facet injection on the T12 to L1 lump level, that is reported with 64490. So just so that you're aware of that. All right, and still, Within the pain management, um, there are some category three codes. During the CPT symposium, the AMA placed them within the pain management section. Um, and so I just thought I'd go ahead and add them here. 
Uh, there is a code for um, therapeutic induction of intrabrain hypothermia. Um, and so what this does is there's a little device that goes around the neck um, and over the head that can help um, monitor and uh, assess, assess the patient. And usually this will be done for something like a concussion, most likely a sports injury, um, but it could also be used, you know, somebody's out skiing and has, uh, you know, an accident or snowboarding or what have you. Um, some other pain management issues that we've seen is um, the transcutaneous magnetic nerve stimulation. Um, and so um, this is used to perform, uh, to treat chronic nerve pain. Um, lots of excludes notes to differentiate between the other ones. So make sure you double check those. And so you can use the um, magnetic stimulation at um, so the nerve is localized, um, and then the skin is marked, and then you um, just provide that electric stimulation to make sure that you're kind of killing the nerve so the patient is not in as much pain. All right, in the eye and adnexa, um, there are just a couple of changes here. Um, they are adding an example of canaloplasty just to align more with the the FDA terminology. And so um, just EG means exemplary, exemplary gratia means for example, as compared to the IE for that it is. Auditory system has a lot of changes. Um, and so they've been doing some changes in this section. And right now, um, it, these updates are basically to make a distinction based on the location and the amount of bone removed. And so these are for your bone anchored hearing loss or the, your Baja devices. And that's where they put the little peg on the, in the skull to a, attach the um, device. And then that allows for the transduction of acoustic energy into the inner ear. Um, and then this is also going to differentiate whether it's within the um, or out, inside or outside the mastoid. And um, some other revisions um, for the 69717 and 19, they removed the word revision at the beginning of the code, so they just say replacement. And then your 69726, and then we'll take a look at the 27. This is for the removal of the entire osseointegrated implant. And then the, the 27 is a little longer. Um, it, this is for that 100 square cent millimeter surface or more. So um, then those two codes are for the removal of the entire implant. If there is a partial removal of the device, like the abutment only, then that's only reported with an ENM code. So they do have some removal of the entire uh, implant for new codes. Um, and the osseointegrated implants are different from the cochlear implants because the cochlear implant Plant takes different work and the electrodes are placed within the inner ear. Um, so it's a lot different work. And radiology, uh, there are just a few changes here. So code 76882 has, um, has been updated to be the limited joint or focal evaluation of non-vascular extremity, extremity structures. So this is when you're just taking a look at a small part of the, uh, of the nerve. And then there's a new code 76883 for um, the entire, an ultrasound of the entire nerve and the instruction. So that's kind of the more comprehensive service. And so if you're just doing a limited study, it's going to be the 76882, where the 76883 is, has to be the entire nerve. Um, there are some updates to the um, <clears throat> SPECT studies. And so what they're adding here is the OR acquisition, because sometimes you'll, you know, the patient will get injected with the radiopharmaceutical, go in and have uh, some of the images acquired, but then another um, radiopharmaceutical is added, you know, administered, and then the patient has to go back for additional acquisition. So this is just adding that um, or acquisition in there just to provide guidance so you know that it's you know per, kind of per acquisition. 
And so um, this, again, is just kind of outlining and providing a little bit more guidance. And kind of the rationale behind that is just to, um, that did not identify the acquisition. And so they were just um, wanting to add that. And so it also allows for more specific reporting and also the better differentiating uh, between those different codes. Now, also added are some bone fracture strength, bone strength and fracture risk codes. And some of these are provided on um, an already obtained film and some include the film. Um, and so uh, just as a word of caution, CMS has said they're not going to cover this and that's because they generally don't cover fracture risk assessments, but they are going to do a national coverage analysis and uh, take comments to see if this is something that they should cover. All right, and I'm uh, for pathology and laboratory, there are just 11 new and three revised. So with the revised codes, um, what they've done is they're kind of differentiating between whether it's the DNA analysis or the RNA analysis, um, and then where it's combined DNA and, or RNA. So with this one, um, the 81445, they're saying that this is for, um, if you're doing DNA only, it would you would use that one, or if you're doing combined DNA and RNA, you would use this code uh, because they have some specific codes now for the RNA analysis. So that way, you know, if the RNA is run later, then you can be consistent with your, um, with the code reporting. All right. And that uh, happens to the eight one, you know, to the several codes here. Um, and then here are the, the new codes just for the RNA. Um, and so you have those codes and just kind of, you know, out of caution, like with the 81418, um, it's a new drug code for drug metabolism that includes specific genes and you must do at least six genes. And if you do, you know, anything under that, then you need to use the category one codes. And then um, these are again, some more RNA analysis, a new code for thiopurine, the TPMT, I'm not gonna try that. Um, and then here we've got uh, a new one for a hep B quantitative. Uh, the qualitative is 87340. Um, and then that's to help monitoring, monitor your, uh, your hepatitis B antigens um, and just to help monitor with different therapies. The other four codes are for reporting for tick-borne illnesses, uh, which are on the rise in the United States. So this will help um, monitor that. There are some proprietary and laboratory analyses codes because there always seems to be, <laughs> those are, are growing by leaps and bounds. Um, so if you use these, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on these because these don't appear to be ones that would be um, done with through a, a CLIA waiver, um, just so that you know that there are available. Um, what's really interesting is they have some category three codes for digitization of slides. And so um, this is distinct from what's happening in the microscope. So what uh, people are able to do is take and digitize it or put it up in the cloud. And it allows a remote pathologist to review. Um, and then it might also um, be expanded to allow for um, AI algorithms. It is not for archiving specimens or to be used during, uh, something might be used during training or teaching. Um, it must be used during the diagnostic process. So they've got codes for the different levels of pathology and then also for the special stains. So there are quite a few of those codes and I'll just kind of flip through those. Um, in the medicine section, we have some uh, different codes. So there's a new one for the respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, this is for the P P Pfizer's RSV pre-F vaccine. It is still not approved yet by the FDA, but they're supposed to be submitting that uh, by the end of the year. What this will do then is allow for coverage for the vaccine for patients 60 or over or um, pregnant ladies in the last uh, second and third trimester. Now for orthoptic 
training, there is a change to the 92065 to say that this, the 92065 is when it's performed by the physician or the QHP. And then if it's done under the supervision, uh, there's a new code, the 92066, when the technician provides the service. Um, and so just some little uh, updates here. Um, the 92229 is that it's autonomous. Um, the, uh, the word automated is removed. Uh, the AMA is um, kind of defining what is automated versus autonomous. Autonomous means that the uh, AI machine kind of also provides uh, the report. Um, the, because the dark ad adaptation examination is diagnostic and not therapeutic, they add the, added the word diagnostic. And then there's a new code, the 95919. There's a new device out that is more subjective in measuring uh, pupil reaction. So um, this would be also used um, in instances when you're doing a neurological examination, like if the patient has neurodegeneration or concussion, um, it can um, measure the expansion or relaxing of that pupil and provide a better report for uh, making treatment decisions. All right, there are some new uh, cardiac cath codes. Um, they're now going to have different codes for reporting the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins and um, selective versus non-selective. So the 93568 has been updated to be non-selective for pulmonary arterial injections. Um, and then the new codes are going to be for the selective pulmonary artery angiography. Um, it lists, you know, what all is included. Um, and then on the second page, we've got the cool nifty abbreviation for MAPCAs, your major aortopulmonary collateral arteries. Uh, so that is going to be uh, for um, kind of the kind of secondary arteries that are also done those. So um, just it, it has to be, you know, in each distinct vessel or distinct lesion. There are some changes into the care behavior management for multiple family group behavior management modification training. Um, this is not the like the, the 994 codes for the modification. This is multiple families where the parent or guardian or caregiver can be uh, receive help in how it, learning how to deal with a patient that um, is having, you know, behavioral issues. So um, if they have the, you know, like children with ADHD and also oppositional defiant behavior, um, this would kind of help the parent, guardian, or caregiver have some coping mechanisms and teach them how to do the positive reinforcement strategies. All right, some other cognitive behavioral therapy monitorings. What they've done for these is um, they have removed like the respiratory system status so that it will just be for therapy adherence. And then there's a new code for therapeutic monitoring um, for cognitive behavioral therapy, and then some new codes in this area for a transcutaneous auricular neurostimulation. And so this is, um, so the application of a, a device. Um, and so this is, it, it kind of stimulates the vagus and trigeminal nerves, and it's to help with opioid withdrawal symptoms. Um, but I've also seen where it can also be used to help um, a depressive disorder. Um, there are some updates to the remote therapeutic activity codes. Um, so they are changing the 0733T to be real-time motion capture-based neuro-rehabilitative. Um, and so this is so that post-stroke rehab could be done in the home uh, through that remote monitoring. Uh, so here's the, also applying that to 0734T. Um, and so we've got some new codes for um, AI insulin dose. And what this does is, is that it helps somebody to uh, get their appropriately adjusted insulin dose in real time. Um, and this is not able to be recorded, uh, reported with the continuous glucose monitoring codes. They're different. 
Um, and so here we've got some AI cardiac functioning services. Um, and so this is where AI is using an EKG, um, whether it's separately obtained or done at the same time. Um, and then it helps the, um, the physician take a look at some of those things and point out uh, where there might be some differences. All right, there's a new code for, um, there's a device that helps um, read the, the pressure for epidural guidance so you can find the um, optimal spot to add that, the, um, add that, uh, put in the epidural. I don't like needles, so it freaks me out. Um, but they should be reported in conjunction with the 62320 through 27. Um, there is, are some codes for virtual reality mediated therapy. This can be help, done to help with a social communication. Um, and it's considered a practice expense and coded once per therapy session. Watch the parenthetical notes because it tells you what to report it with or not. Um, but there are some new codes for procedural dissociation services. And so what this does is it um, induces an altered state of consciousness um, to help um, optimize patient comfort. It is not considered um, general anesthesia or MAC. Uh, and so what it does is it helps alleviate anxiety and or decrease pain. So I kind of, my mind went to, well, maybe this would be good for somebody who um, experiences anxiety prior to an MRI. They could go into this little Instead of stepping through the holodeck on the Starship Enterprise, it would be a device that they could wear to induce that state. So there are two different services. Um, the only real thing is it should not be um, reported if it's used under 10 minutes and the patient has to be over five years of age. Now, I did add some uh, Slides here for e &M services, but we're not going to be able to get to them. It's kind of a Cliff Notes version. So when you download the, download the slide deck, you'll have them available. And with that, I will let you wrap up. Awesome. Thank you, Arias. That was great. Yeah, we're over time, so I'll do a super quick wrap up. Um, I have a quick poll I'm going to launch asking if you'd like to be contacted by us to learn more. And as we mentioned, um, we will send out the link to the recording and slide deck as well as the CU certificates by end of day today. Just reach out to me if you do not receive them. And a reminder that you can view all of our webinars on demand at vitalware.com. You just go to the webinars page and all of the recordings will be in there. This is our last one for the year, so we won't see or hear from a lot of you until after the new year. So we hope that everyone has a happy, healthy, safe holiday season. And I think that's all that we have. Thank you so much. Bye everyone.